our speakers come up to the stage. We're really excited for this session. This is always one of the really um, sessions that we look forward to hearing new data. And um, we are gonna be on a time crunch, not really a time crunch, we just gotta stay on time. So each speaker is gonna have eight minutes and there is a clock. And after each two speakers, we're gonna have time for 12 minutes of Q&A. And um, if people are going over, I like Tony's strategy of walking by you and kind of pacing to keep, make sure that you stay on time. And I'm sure Josh has some remarks as well. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. We, you know, I think this is probably, not to put the other sessions down, but this is a real highlight because we get to see um, new investigators with emerging exciting data. And really what we would ask of everyone in the audience is your active participation in questions because that's what's going to be so generative in terms of the outcomes and what follows from these exciting research projects. And I will say, I flew from Madison, Wisconsin just to be Raina's muscle. So you are required to be on time. Um, so with that, um, if we wanna go ahead and get started, we'll invite our first speaker up. So Joe Lee from Memorial Sloan Kennering, presenting on a final database lock results for the phase two cohort of lenvatinib, pembrolizumab for progressive disease after PD-1, pd one containing therapy in metastatic clear cell, real cell carcinoma. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, so on behalf of the investigators for study 111 uh, or keynote 146, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to present the results of our phase 1B slash 2 of uh, lenvatinib and pembrolizumab in patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So the combination of lenvatinib and pembro is currently approved based off of the uh, first line results from the CLEAR study, uh, where they demonstrated an improvement in overall survival, progression free survival, and objective response rate compared to sinitinib. Uh, today, what we'll be doing is presenting the final analysis of the phase 1B slash 2 of the lenvatinib pembro combination. Uh, in this study, uh, eligible patients had to have metastatic uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma with measurable disease by IR resist. Uh, and up to two lines of prior uh, anti-cancer therapy was allowed. This really allowed for three distinct uh, cohorts to be evaluated. One was a treatment naive cohort. The second was a previously treated but ICI naive cohort and one including ICI pretreated patients. Patients were treated with lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab, um, lenvatinib at 20 milligrams and pembro at uh, 200 milligrams every three weeks. The primary endpoint was the objective response rate at week 24. Key secondary endpoints was uh, the objective response, the best object, the best response, uh, the duration of response, progression-free survival, uh, and also overall survival, and also safety and tolerability. In the initial FSD analysis, uh, we demonstrated an objective response rate at 24 months of 73% for uh, the treatment naive cohort. 41% for patients who were previously treated, but ICI naive, and 56% in patients who were ICI pretreated. Here we report the results of the additional 24 months of follow-up um, following the final database lock in August of 2022. So at the time of the final database lock, the median duration of follow-up for the entire cohort ended up being about 38 months. Uh, 22 patients were enrolled in the treatment naive cohort, 17 were previously treated, but ICI naive, and 104 patients uh, in the ICI pre-treated cohort. By both MSKCC and IMDC risk stratification, um, you know, most patients had uh, either intermediate or poor risk disease and greater than two sites of metastatic disease by independent radiographic review. So in the treatment naive cohort or the blue line that you see up there, like 77% of patients had a partial response as their best response and the median duration of response was 24 months. The objective response rate at the 30 month landmark was uh, four, uh, 41 months. However, in previously treated patients the results were actually similar, regardless of whether or not they were had prior ICI therapy. In ICI naive patients, uh, as represented in the green line over there, and ICI pretreated patients, as represented by the gold. In ICI, in the ICI naive cohort, 53% uh, of patients had a partial response. In the ICI pretreated cohort, 59% uh, of patients had an objective response, which included one patient uh, with a complete response. 
In ICI naive patients, the median duration of response was nine months with 22% remaining and maintaining their response for greater than 24 months. In the ICI pre-treated cohort, the median duration of response was 14 months with 25% of patients maintaining their response for greater than 24 months. Now, focusing on the 104 patients that were previously treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors, the median time from the last anti-cancer therapy that they received uh, to the first dose of study drug was about 1.5 months, with 92% of the patients uh, receiving an immune checkpoint inhibitor as part of their most recent line of systemic therapy. In this waterfall plot, you know, patients are kind of color-coded based off the type of systemic therapy they, they received immediately before lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab. Responses to lenvatinib and pembro uh, were seen regardless of what type of systemic therapy uh, they received as their last prior therapy. Here, we have the Kaplan-Meier curves for progression-free survival with a similar pattern with what we saw with duration of response. Again, blue representing the treatment-naive cohort, green representing previously treated at ICI naive, and then gold representing uh, ICI pre-treated patients. In the treatment naive patients, the median progression free survival was 22.1 months with a 30 month PFS rate of 34%. Outcomes for previously treated uh, patients were again similar, uh, regardless of whether or not uh, they were ICI experienced. In the ICI naive patients, the median PFS was 11.8 months and the ICI pre-treated patients were 11.6 months. At the 30 month landmark, 14% of ICI naive patients remained progression free and 19% of patients uh, remained progression free in the ICI pre-treated cohort. Now, looking at the overall survival results, um, in the treatment IA cohort, the median overall survival was 55.8 months. In median for in the pre-treated patients, the median overall survival was 30 months and 32 months in ICI naive and ICI pre-treated patients respectively. And at the 30 month uh, landmark time point, the survival rate was 54% in both cohorts. Toxicities were consistent with what was seen in the phase three study and no new safety signals were identified with extended follow-up. For patients who were treatment naive, the first time to uh, dose reduction of lenvatinib, the median time to first dose reduction of lenvatinib was at 6.5 months. For patients that were previously treated, the median time to first dose reduction of lenvatinib was at 2.9 months for ICI naive patients and 2.1 months for ICI uh, pre-treated patients. High dose steroids, defined as greater than uh, 40 milligrams per day, were required in approximately 30% of patients in the overall cohort. And this really breaks down to about 36% of patients um, in the naive cohort, 24% in the ICI naive cohort, and then 30% in the ICI experience cohort. So, in conclusion, um, Lenvapembro shows uh, anti-cancer activity in patients with metastatic uh, RCC after extended follow-up. The responses remain durable in a subset of patients uh, who were previously treated but ICI naive, but also in patients who received ICI as their prior systemic therapy. The safety profiles will remain manageable and consistent with prior studies. So I would like to thank, like, all of the uh, patients and families who took part in this clinical trial and all of the investigators and the study teams that made this protocol possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. There we go. Thank you very much and perfectly timed. That's impressive. Um, so we'd like to uh, welcome our next speaker, Dr. Yasser Ged from John Hopkins University present the ORCID trial, a phase two study of olaparib in metastatic renal cell carcinoma patients harboring a BAP1 or other DNA repair gene mutation. Good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the organizing committee for uh, selecting our work for presentation. This is an interim analysis of the ORCID study, which is a phase two study of uh, olaparib in metastatic renal cell carcinoma patients harboring BAP1 or other DNA repair gene mutations. <clears throat> 
I have no relevant disclosures. As a background, alterations in the DNA damage repair genes, short for DDR, are frequent in multiple cancers, including renal cell carcinoma. PARP inhibitors are known to lead to cancer cell death through the synthetic lethality mechanism with mutant DNA repair pathway genes, in particular through the HR pathway. And currently, there are several PARP inhibitors which are approved in multiple solid tumors, including ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, breast, and pancreatic cancers. PAP1, short for BRCA1 associated protein, is a tumor suppressor gene, which is well known to the audience here. And it's known to be associated with aggressive renal cell carcinoma tumors. It regulates key cellular pathways, including activity in the DDR pathway. In RCC, there is a preclinical rationale, a preclinical data for the activity of PARP inhibitors in RCC cell lines, and also work from UT Southwestern demonstrated activity of PARP inhibitors in BAB1 deficient cell lines. In view of this, we thought about investigating the activity of Olaparib in patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma with DNA damage repair gene alterations. So the ORCID study is a phase two investigator initiated study uh, investigating the use of Olaparib in kidney cancer patients. And the key eligibility criteria in the study were patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma who had received at least one prior line of systemic therapy with evidence of pathogenic somatic or germline DDR gene alterations with an equal performance status of zero to one and uh, adequate renal, uh, hepatic and hematological functions. The list of the DDR gene alterations on the protocol are, are listed here on the slide. And the total sample size of the study was 20 patients. In particular, the study design was enriched for patients with BAP1 mutations, as we aim to include at least 10 patients out of the 20 with BAP1 mutations. All eligible candidates for the study received Olaparib immunotherapy, starting with a dose of 150 milligrams twice daily for four weeks as a safety run-in phase. And the rationale for that is because Olaparib can lead to kidney damage and we were cautious uh, in patients with kidney cancer uh, in obviously leading to kidney injury. After the first four weeks, a patient then received Olaparib at the full dose, which is 300 milligrams twice daily until an acceptable toxicity, disease progression or withdrawal from the study. The primary endpoint of the study was the disease control rate defined as CR, PR, or stable disease for at least six months based on RESIST 1.1 radiological assessment. The key secondary endpoints on the study were uh, safety, PFS, objective response rate. And the study was designed in a Simons Minimax two-stage design with a total sample size of 20 patients. And this is an interim analysis after the pre-specified endpoints for the Simons stage one design were reached. So at the time of this report, a total of 13 patients were enrolled in the study. Uh, the median age of patients was 43 and 77% of the patients were male. 70% of the patients had an ECOG performance status of one and the predominant histology was clear cell RCC in 77% of the patients followed by two patients who had unclassified RCC and one patient with papillary RCC. The IMDC scores at the time of starting therapy were 64% in intermediate risk score and the rest of the patients had favorable or poor risk disease. In terms of the prior lines of therapy, the majority of patients had at least three or higher uh, uh, prior lines of therapy, including 46% of patients. And I would say that also three patients had five and six prior lines of therapy. It's important to note as well that all of the patients received prior immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors. Uh, regarding the genetic defects, um, eight out of the 13 patients had BAP1 mutation, and the other most frequently mutated mutations included ATM, BOB2, BRCA1, and BRCA2. Looking at the interim efficacy assessment, uh, examining the early um, uh, disease control uh, rate activity out of 11 patients um, with a valuable disease. Uh, the disease control rate was achieved in two out of 11 patients, which is 
and one out of the 11 patients, which is 9%, had a partial response. And stable disease of any degree, more or less than six months, was seen in two out of 11 patients. Uh, the figure here illustrates the waterfall plots for the disease responses. I would also say that three out of 11 patients had any degree of tumor reduction, including two patients with BAP1 mutations. And one of those patients had, with a, with a pathogenic BAP1 mutation, had a deep, durable partial response uh, up to 72% on single agent Olaparib. An additional patient with BAP1 mutation had prolonged stable disease for 10 months. The study made the pre-specified endpoint for Simon stage one design and is still currently enrolling in the Simon in the stage two design and hopefully will be able to complete the study soon. Regarding the toxicity assessment, overall Olaparib monotherapy was well tolerated with limited grade three or higher adverse events. The most common adverse events that were encountered, including anemia, which is known to um, happen with, with PARP inhibitors, followed by diarrhea, fatigue, and increased creatinine. However, for the increased creatinine toxicity in patients with kidney cancer, none of the patients had grade three or higher adverse events. This is, the, this is a case study of the patient with the exceptional response on Olaparib, who is a 61-year-old patient, female patient was diagnosed with metastatic clear cell RCC. The patient received pemprolizumab plus axitinib as first-line therapy, had evidence of disease progression, and then came to see us in the clinic. We sent the tumor for sequencing, and which revealed the pathogenic frame shift FAB1 mutation. So we enrolled the patient on the study, and the first time the response was achieved at three months. And subsequently, that response was translated into a, into a deep partial response at 72%. The patient is still on the study with a duration of response of 14 months thus far. The, uh, the, the figures here illustrate some of the, base, the sorry, the, the sites of baseline evaluable disease were lung nodules and mediastinal adenopathy, but the figures here illustrate some of the changes on some of the mediastinal adenopathy from baseline and at three months. In conclusion, Olaparib monotherapy demonstrated some anti-tumor activity in patients with kidney cancer, which was mainly seen in patients with PAP1 mutations. Olaparib monotherapy overall demonstrated tolerable safety profile in patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Further exploration of the results with correlative studies are underway, and this will be critical in designing the future PARP inhibitor studies in kidney cancer. With that, I would like to humbly thank all of the patients and families who supported the research and AstraZeneca for funding the research. Thank you. Great, we'd like to go ahead and open up the floor to any questions and maybe I could kick things off. And um, in terms of the Olaparib study, I'm intrigued by your initial response, especially the deep response of BAP1. Could you comment on is your expansion cohort? Is this something where you still want to include all types of DDR mutations or for example, ATM? Is that something where you want to continue enrolling patients with that cohort or maybe focus more on a BAP1 mutated signature group? Uh, excellent question. Obviously, um, we were intrigued as well by the results that we saw. I would also add that, uh, is it working? I would, I would also add that um, when we looked at the BAP1 mutation patients in the efficacy analysis, there were seven uh, patients in that efficacy analysis and uh, shrinkage was seen in two out of seven patients. And uh, three out of seven patients had stable disease. So obviously there's something happening with the BAB1 mutation patients. We're exploring that in a correlative analysis, looking at some signatures like the HRD score. And um, so there's a possibility that we're gonna end up amending the protocol depending on what we learned from an ongoing uh, correlative study right now. Uh, but um, I agree that uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a lot of uh, pop inhibitor studies, which were, I wouldn't say unfortunate, but I would say that as we're trying to learn early uh, in the disease setting, there has been PARP inhibitor studies, but they have included a lot of uh, DDR mutations. So we have to think carefully about which mutations we need to include and about specific biomarkers. Like I said, maybe it could be the HRD, the three HRD signature score. That might be the next thing that we'll, we'll look into. No, exciting approach for precision medicine in RCC. Other questions from the audience? We have one over here. Yeah, yeah thank you. Dr. Joe, question to you. In the 104 ICI pretreated patients, do you believe there is any contribution by Pembro, or do you think the activity is driven by linvatinib? And what is the next step 
with this study? Are there plans to have a randomized trial or do you think this is the, the end? I mean, certainly like the trial is not designed for us to truly prove whether or not there's a contribution between the two regimens. Um, you know, I think that there's certainly a lot of preclinical data indicating that there is some interaction between uh, TKIs and IO, whether or not that actually translates to a clinical outcome. Uh, certainly the negative contact O3 data uh, puts that in proposition a little bit more to question. I think that there are a lot of things that we have to consider, namely PD-1 versus PDL one is one of those factors. The other thing is, you know, whether or not ICIs and when that ICIs combine with different TKIs differently also uh, remains a question. And I think that perhaps is also worth answering. Um, now, my personal bias, and this is probably completely a bias, is that, you know, I do believe that there's probably some type of interaction between uh, the compounds and uh, whether, and, you know, some of these we certainly should be thinking about as a regimen as, as opposed to the only the individual components. Um, however, you know, that's something that really needs to be supported by data and not just like my personal feelings. Like, um, and I think that uh, for this regimen going forward, you know, this is certainly the, the final analysis, you know, this regimen is being studied further, you know, in ICI pre-treated patients, um, you know, in uh, Merck's uh, UO3B studies, their umbrella studies, where it uses lenvatinib pembrolizumab as a backbone. Uh, certainly, I think that those trials, again, are not quite designed to answer this question, but it is comparing uh, either multiple combinations or additions of, to a triplet. So I think that it's still reasonable to consider this as a backbone. And there are also some non pembro containing arms in those that. Joe, fantastic data. Thank you for sharing these. Um, so in line with Nizar question, did you look at within those patients pre-treated, the reason for treatment discontinuation uh, in the IO based uh, regimen, yeah. uh, such as toxicity or you know, yeah. other cause, did you look at that? Yeah, so we did look at that. Um, I don't have the numbers off of the top of my head, but predominantly, you know, patients discontinued for progression of disease, um, very similar to, um, you know, most other studies. And it wasn't just a, uh, they came off for tox and like had maintained a long sort of uh, uh, treatment free interval. The protocol did require progression um, of some sort uh, that had to be confirmed. So. And Dr. McKay is going to exert moderator privileges to ask the next question. Do you know what the prior therapies were actually like IOIO versus uh, amount of people that got IOTKI and just exactly what yeah. they received? Yeah, so we did. So that we included some of that information in the, the waterfall plot. Like, you know, I think that the dominant regimen that was certainly there, um, you know, we had quite a few people that had it be Nevo as their uh, line of therapy that they got that they progressed off of, uh, you know, certainly based off of the timing of the protocol, we did then have a sufficient, significant cohort that, you know, was back in the days in which you did TKI and then Nevo and then progressed. Um, I would say that the percentage of people who got a TKI IO combination uh, was relatively low. I think that came out to be uh, 7%. And to follow on that, actually, when looking at your PFS, um, slides that it appears that roughly about 20% of patients in the IO group progress within six months. Do you have a sense for the prior therapies that those patients received and the response to that prior therapies meeting? Was that a group of patients that have intrinsic resistance to IO? Yeah, so we didn't look at that um, as carefully as we you know probably could. I think that it is a very interesting question. Um, most people, it was quite a bit of diversity that was there. I think that part of it is if you think about from a timing of protocol sort of standpoint, like uh, for people who progressed in Epinevo, just because this is what it was available at the time, most of those people were going to be people who had pr primary progression on Epinevo. Um, I think that you probably for uh, patients who got Nevo as their direct prior, uh, those people tended to 
span a spectrum. Like the, they could be people who had been on for a long period of time, some people who are a bit shorter. For people who uh, progressed on a TKI IO combination, most of those were essentially primary progressors. And my friend from the Big Ten. Dr. Sakuri. Yeah, thank you, my friend. Uh, so, Joe, again, a question to you. Uh, in, in your waterfall plot, uh, you, you showed that uh, the red color, I think they got the prior IOTKI and they, some of them had nice response. Uh, were they treated right uh, uh, with, with IOTKI right prior they went on the trial or there was like multiple other uh, treatments in between? And the reason I ask that really because of the study you mentioned uh, with the umbrella trial U01, U03, uh, uh, which we had open at our center. And sometimes I, I struggle to, to, to randomize my patient to Pembrolin after failing another IOTKI. So, so I, I, I don't know if that's ethical from moving from IOTKI to another IOTKI. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, so actually the, the waterfall plot that we showed, um, the colors are actually by the direct prior therapy. Uh, so, you know, so the responses that you see uh, for the TKIO patients, um, you know, this is right after, you know, progression on a TKIO regimen. Can I ask a question of Yasser? <clears throat> so uh, my question has to do with um, the clonality of BAP1. So if, if you think that the response is due to BAP1, do you have the ability to biopsy the tumor after to see if for example, the variant allele frequency of BAP1 has gone down, or can you look at um, circulating DNA, for example? Is there a way to um, confirm that the, the drug is hitting its presumed target? Yeah, excellent question. I, um, it's a bit still like a conundrum exactly why this patient responded, only the BAP1 or something else. Also, I would also want to say that that patient received immunotherapy prior to getting on the study. So there's a possibility that maybe the PARP inhibitor activates sting as well. So, but um, um, I would, uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, built in in the protocol to biopsy after treatment, but we are collecting blood samples uh, before and after. So we will be studying like some of the some of the circulating biomarkers. And yes, sir, one more question. Following up on that, you know, especially I think in the community that um, biopsies and sequencing and RCC is quite variable and probably on the low end. Do you have a sense for the frequency of BAP1 mutations and might that be again, how common should we expect to see it and how could we start to counsel our community providers in terms of sequencing metastatic RCC? Well, based on the literature, the reports are reporting anything from six to 15% is the prevalence of BAP1 mutations. So, and generally speaking, those tumors are inflamed, aggressive, there's obviously lots of data that they respond better to immunotherapy and they mostly have like an immunogenic profile, but, uh, but all of those patients receive immunotherapy, which can, um, and we don't have like a lot of options for people who are progressing immunotherapy and that kind of emphasizes the importance of personalized medicine and having sequencing data and um, uh, that we're gonna learn more and hopefully, obviously with the ultimate goal of helping our patients. You know, it's interesting because you said that that patient that had a deep response had just received immunotherapy. How do they do um, on their immunotherapy? Uh, that patient progressed, I think, around roughly around 11 to 12 months, which is kind of like the average median time for people on um, uh, PEM AXI. And uh, given just how durable the response is now, like over a year, closer to a year and a half, I doubt that is actual immunotherapy, which we're seeing a late effect. Maybe there could have been some signal with like PAB1 and sting activation or after the immunotherapy, we don't know yet. So. All right, so we're going to go on to our next two speakers. Our next individual is Vincent Du from the Dana-Farber talking about circulating Kim one All right, thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon, and thank you to the abstract committee for selecting this abstract for presentation. And on behalf of my co-authors, I'm glad to present our exploratory analysis circulating CHEM1 as a minimally invasive biomarker correlated with treatment response to nivolumab in metastatic renal cell carcinoma. As this group is very well aware, nivolumab is approved for treatment of renal cell carcinoma and has been associated with dramatic and deep responses in some patients, but also with no response and toxicity in other patients. Circulating CHEM1 is a minimally invasive biomarker for kidney cancer but it's not known whether longitudinal 
changes in KIM-1 can help to identify early responders or non-responders to treatment with immunotherapy. If we were able to very early identify patients who don't respond to immunotherapy, this would facilitate minimizing exposure for patients to unnecessary or ineffective therapy and toxicity risk. In Checkmate 009, patients with metastatic RCC who were refractory to prior TKIs were treated with nivolumab at one of three different doses at an every 21 day cycle. In this exploratory biomarker analysis, we measured serum KIM-1 at baseline pretreatment and after 21 days of treatment with nivolumab after a single dose of Nevo. Both times the measurement was done using a custom sandwich immunoassay for KIM-1. And we assessed to see whether changes in KIM-1 after 21 days may correlate with patient outcomes. The patient characteristics were typical of what you would expect for a patient population that's post first line TKI. The underlying Checkmate 009 trial was done in the post TKI era. The majority of patients were male as expected for clear cell RCC. And most patients received nivolumab at the 10 milligram per kilogram dose, which of course is not our usual dose. Uh, looking at prior therapies, all patients received prior VEGF directed therapy, and most patients received VEGF as the most recent prior line of therapy. This is the baseline distribution of serum KIM-1 levels prior to treatment with nivolumab. And for comparison, I've included a cohort of 48 healthy volunteers from the Brigham and Women's Biobank. As you can see, the median baseline KIM-1 level was much higher in metastatic patients compared to healthy volunteers with a median of 5,900 compared to a median of 59 in healthy volunteers. Um, this was not the main objective of this analysis, but if you did try to use uh, serum KIM-1 as a way to differentiate metastatic RCC patients from healthy volunteers, the discrimination was very good with an AUC ROC of 0 0.995. We looked to see if baseline pretreatment KIM-1 may correlate with clinical outcomes. Um, this would make sense because we know that in other cohorts, the amount of KIM-1 in circulation seems to correlate with total tumor burden, and one might expect that patients with more tumor burden may have higher risk of death. And indeed, patients with higher KIM-1, dichotomized at the median, high versus low KIM-1, seem to have worse overall survival with a log rank of 0 0.1. When we put this into a univariable Cox survival model, which allows us to account for the degree of elevation in KIM-1 instead of just a binary outcome. Uh, this was significant with a p-value of 0.003. And as we might expect, because KIM-1 at baseline doesn't necessarily correlate with immunotherapy response, there was no association between baseline KIM-1 level and progression-free survival. We looked at how much KIM-1 changed between the first day and day 21. Interestingly, about half of patients had increase in KIM-1 and half of patients had decrease in KIM-1 at 21 days. The split was 48 to 52%. And most patients had relatively small relative changes in KIM-1, although some patients had more dramatic change. And the amount of change ranged from a 70% decrease up until a 131% increase. We looked at the main outcome of our uh, exploratory analysis, which was whether these changes in KIM-1 might correlate with progression-free survival. Indeed, when we dichotomize patients into two groups, patients where KIM-1 went up versus KIM-1 went down at 21 days, there was a difference in progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.22. And this remained significant after adjusting for sex, prior nephrectomy, nivolumab dose received, as well as the IMDC risk factors. We next look to see whether these changes in KIM-1 may also correlate with survival and radiographic response. And indeed, there was a trend where patients with increasing KIM-1 seem to have lower overall survival, where patients with decreasing KIM-1 seem to have better overall survival. In addition, when we looked at subsequent best radiographic response in the trial, the 21-day KIM-1 did seem to correlate with better chance of better radiographic response subsequently in the trial. In conclusion, 
serum Kim one is highly elevated in all patients in this cohort that we evaluated with metastatic RCC. Among patients who are treated with nivolumab in this refractory RCC trial, a decrease in Kim one between day one to day 21 was strongly associated with progression-free survival with a multivariable hazard ratio of 0.22. This suggests that perhaps changes dynamically in serum Kim one may be an early indicator of subsequent radiographic response and outcomes. This is a very, very small exploratory analysis with a total of only 54 patients. And so validation of these findings in larger trials is currently underway. I would like to thank my mentors and collaborators at Dana-Farber and at Beth Israel and Brigham Women's Hospital, as well as in particular, my colleagues and um, collaborators at BMS who gave us access to the Checkmate 009 samples, as well as Dr. Rupal Bhatt in particular, who was my mentor when she was at Beth Israel and is now also at BMS. Thank you very much for your attention. Vincent, we're gonna have a little switcheroo in the schedule um, just for timing and travel. Um, we'll have Ed Resnick from MSKCC come and present his work on functional and, and translational consequences of immunometabolomic um, co-evolution in clear cell RCC, or metabolic, I should say. All right, well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and tell you about our work. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a computational biologist. I work in Memorial Sloan Kettering, and for the last 10 years, um, I've been working with Ari Hakimi and a fantastic team to study the metabolism of queer cell and non-queer cell forms of kidney cancer. So today, I want to tell you about some of our recent work, which has to do with a phenomenon that I think we're trying to understand more, which is uh, metabolic heterogeneity. So I'm sure many of us are familiar with the seminal work of Charlie Swan and many others sort of establishing that genetically, if you look um, at a queer cell tumor, you will find that there are a number of genetically distinct clones and the presence and identity of those clones has significant prognostic and therapeutic implications. And so we basically wanted to investigate whether a similar phenomenon would happen um, when studying the metabolism of these tumors. So together with Ari and his team, we assembled a cohort of about 30 uh, queer cell tumors, and we multi-regionally profiled them using metabolomics, DNA, and RNA sequencing. So within the tumors, it was something like three to five regions, and we also profiled um, between one and three regions of the adjacent normal. And um, whether you look at the data in an unsupervised way or a supervised way, a few very interesting things pop out. The first is that um, the heterogeneity really doesn't break down by pathway. It's very specific metabolites. And one of the really phenomenally interesting drivers that we identified was cysteine. So among all of the proteinogenic amino acids, the only one which is really heterogeneous is cysteine. If you were to pit two regions from the same tumor and compare the levels of cysteine, they would be about threefold different. Um, and when we dug deeper into this, using some unsupervised methods, we noticed something interesting about cysteine high regions, which is that they had high levels of polyunsaturated fatty acids. They had high levels of oxphos expression and high levels of the gene expression signature associated with reactive oxygen species. And this immediately made us think of a phenomenon called ferroptosis, which is an iron mediated form of cell death where polyunsaturated fatty acids um, undergo lipid peroxidation. And to counteract ferroptosis, what actually happens in, in these tumors, we think, is that they accumulate cysteine. And the thing that cysteine is actually used to make, among other things, like proteins, which is the uh, antioxidant tripeptide glutathione. So high cysteine regions are not only more susceptible to ferroptosis, but apparently they seem to compensate for that susceptibility. So naturally, we wanted to know, was this a tumor cell intrinsic phenomenon where the tumor cells themselves driving this heterogeneity? And so in order to do that, using um, multi-regional data, we use MITS-EFFETS modeling. And the surprising thing that we found is that a huge fraction of the metabolome, of the variation in the metabolome intratumorally has nothing to do with the tumor. It seems to do more with the extent of immune infiltration in the tumor. So something like for 8% of the metabolome, 8% of all the metabolites that we interrogated, their intratumoral variation could be ascribed simply to how uh, pure that tumor region was. And that's not just a queer cell specific phenomenon. In a sister paper that we published, that's a pan-cancer analysis, we saw the exact same thing in the exact same metabolites. 
And most interestingly, the metabolites which seem to strongly associate with immune infiltration are actually NAD-related metabolites, not just NAD itself, but quinolinate, nicotinamide, riboside, and stuff like that. So we obviously wanted to be more granular about this. So we went and uh, using the same sort of mitz defense modeling approach, we interrogated the covariation between um, prognostically significant uh, RNA signatures of the CCRCC microenvironment and their association with metabolite levels. And if you had asked me to bet on this beforehand, I definitely would have put my money on angiogenesis. But as it turns out, whether you're looking at a T effector signature or an angiogenic um, signature, there's almost no covariation between the metabolomes. So having a very highly angiogenic region apparently does not perturb the pool size of metabolites. Remarkably, what does perturb the, the pool size of metabolites is the abundance of myeloid cells in a particular region of the tumor. And this immediately, immediately made us think of um, the excellent work from Vanderbilt and the Kim Rathmel. So the, the reason I really wanted to tell you guys about this is that um, <clears throat> as a result of sort of doing this analysis, we realized that these RNA signatures of the microenvironment associate with um, metabolism, we can play an interesting game, which is to use RNA signatures themselves to directly impute otherwise unmeasured metabolite pools. So why might you wanna do this? Well, many of us are interested in studying metabolism, but we're um, sort of limited by the fact that even though mass spectrometry is a pretty mature technology, um, you need a very particular kind of tissue to do it. You need fresh frozen tissue. Um, and it's just not something that's widely done. But if we know that RNA uh, levels co-vary with metabolite levels, we can use machine learning presumably to um, to basically democratize metabolomic data analysis and impute otherwise unmeasured metabolite levels. So we repurposed an algorithm we, that we had published with Wes Tansy a few years ago called Mirth. He came up with the name, not me. And we um, decided to see if we could impute metabolite levels directly from RNA sequencing data and CCRCC tissues. And in fact, we can. So we have a model uh, that imputes the levels of 262 metabolites. And so we thought, okay, this is great. What can we do with it? Um, we uh, learned that, well, there's a lot of publicly available RNA sequencing data from clinical trials evaluating um, immunotherapies uh, against usually sunitinib and clear cell. And so what we decided to do was for each one of those trials amounting to something like 2000 patients to impute the levels of these 200 metabolites and to do uh, essentially a meta-analysis to identify metabolite biomarkers of response or intrinsic resistance to these therapies. So it turns out that in the IO arms, which are heterogeneous therapies um, in diverse cohorts of patients, there's no real consistent biomarker of response. But interestingly, um, when you look at the control arms, which are overwhelmingly sunitinib, you, um, you, do, see, um, you do see some metabolite biomarkers or metabolite correlates of response. And that's not so surprising because there are RNA signatures of response to sunitinib. So we were interested in what these metabolite uh, correlates would be. And the best hit ended up being a metabolite called 1-methylamidazole acetate. I'm sure you've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. It's a downstream catabolite of histamine. So that suggests that um, in the patients who respond to sunitinib, there's probably more mast cells and more inflammatory conditions. And presumably that histamine is being catabolized to uh, one methyl and is elastic. And that's an effect that's reproduced across essentially all of these trials. So the reason I raise this point in this setting is that this is a totally publicly available algorithm. We have models that are trained to impute metabolite levels in primary tumor uh, tissues as well as cell lines. And this is something that the community at large can do um, really rapidly to just test metabolic hypotheses that then you could um, design experiments around. So with that, I'll close and just acknowledge the people who did the work in my lab. It's really Cerise Tang, who did a wonderful job and presented here last year. My long-term collaboration with Ari, our funding sources, and of course, the patients who have driven this research. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was spectacular. Um, metabolism is always so complicated. But um, questions? Tony wants the box. I mean, Ed, uh, really, really beautiful data here, taking it to the next level in ComBio. 
I wonder with all what you find, what could be the next study in term of a clinical uh, trial? I mean, like Reina said, it's extremely complicated to understand it. And especially with what Kim and Jeff reported about, you know, what type of cell produce or consume um, sugar and what type of sugar was it an immune cell, a cancer cell, a cell I've never heard of, and what type of immune cell? It gets really, really complicated. So how this can inform maybe a next uh, study? I don't expe expect it to be as simple as the chromophobe and IL-15 story, which is not simple, but at least we could understand it. So, Yeah, so uh, it's a really dangerous game to ask a PhD uh, a question like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say that the, the one takeaway from this work is that I think a lot of the metabolic phenotypes that we have observed for a long time in uh, kidney tumors are not necessarily arising from tumor cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, just being able to understand the cell types that are being affected by the therapies that we're administering, I think might yield quite a few insights. I, I can't say that it's very easy to do that. Um, him and Jeff's work is like, a, that's a landmark paper. And even so, I think there's a lot further that it has to go before we can really quantitatively un understand in vivo what's happening. But there are new technologies that are coming. So mass spec imaging is coming and it's coming paired with um, isotope tracing experiments. So the, the work of Ralph DiBerardinas comes to mind. I think that that is going to answer some really basic questions that we thought we had the answers to, but maybe we don't yet. So my question is with regard to non-clear cell, uh, you showed us uh, some piece of data about this. We can expect it would be quite different. So did you look in all the data sets? Uh, you're talking about the heterogeneity part or, uh, yeah. So we have some data on, um, non-queer cell? Uh, I, I don't know the answer, but it, this is not a hard study to, to carry out if you have tissue. Metabolomics is actually, believe it or not, it's cheaper than sequencing. So um, something that the people can readily can readily do. And if, if you'd like, you can um, send us an email. I'm sure we'd be happy to share the, I think the, the one tumor we certainly have um, that's non-queer cell is an FH deficient RCC, yeah. And did you generate the data in these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, my position, and I think Ari's position also, is that we need to make the data readily available. And all the data, um, both the kidney cancer data and the pan cancer data, which is a thousand tumor specimens with matched RNA and metabolomics, that's all publicly available right now. And anybody can go and download it. Yeah. Just one. Vincent, do you know the, um, is the whole extracellular domain of Kim one cleaved or does anything know about that? And my second related question is, is the biological half-life of the cyber form now? All right, uh, Dr. Morasco, thank you for the question. Um, the amount of the extracellular domain that's cleaved is about 90 kilodaltons. So I, I don't think it's the whole extracellular domain. I think there's a part that remains on the membrane. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. Oh, half -life. Half -life. Half -life. Um, um, the half-life has been described in the past, and this was done in um, aorta clamping studies of hypoxic kidney injury. And so the levels of Kim-1 were not quite as high, um, but the Kim-1 half-life, if I remember correctly, was about five days. I have one for Ed Resnick, Ed Marston Linehan. Really beautiful presentation. We, we followed your work for a long time. It, do you have any, even though it's potentially at least a, maybe a big signal is coming from non-renal cell, any sense or ideas about any genomic changes in the tumor that might uh, associate? Like for example, if, if there, the presence of a mutation might uh, predispose you to have a certain metabolic phenotype. Yeah, we've tried. Um, uh, so once we developed this imputation approach, we actually imputed um, in the TCGA all the metabolite levels that we could. And I think that there are some weak signals, but nothing, nothing really pops out. But again, the, the thing I would really emphasize is like in some of these tumors, half the tumor is not, not tumor cells. So 
you know, unless um, even in FH deficient RCC, sometimes we only see a twofold upregulation of fumarate. And that is the most killer mutation you can have in terms of producing a metabolic phenotype. So I think uh, my, my hypothesis going in was certainly that we will find an association between genotype and metabolic phenotype. And I think um, the reality is that uh, it's especially in kidney cancer that's so immune infiltrated, it's less likely to, to happen. I think it does happen probably in other diseases where like for example, in the lung, I'm sure uh, STK11, keep one mutant lung adenoid carcinomas, that's gonna be very different from EGFR mutant you know, STK11 wild type uh, one, I don't know. Thank you, Lisa. Oh yes, another question for Ed. Um, I wonder if you could clarify the ferroptosis observations that you mentioned. If I understood correctly, there's a distribution of that. And is it, are you seeing a stronger signature in the myeloid rich regions? Uh, that's a good question. So yeah, imagine that you were to do principal components analysis on our, multi-regional data, just to find the dominant modes of variation. Surprisingly, the metabolites which really drive all the intratumoral variation are metabolites like cysteine, glutathione, um, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And so actually within any one tumor, you will be able to find a cysteine high region and a cysteine low region. And so then if you ask me, okay, well, what is the difference between those two? The cysteine high ones, um, th there is no difference in purity, but the cysteine high ones, they have more polyunsaturated fatty acids, more cysteine work with ion, more OTSFAS expression. Um, I do think that they are more myeloid infiltrated, but I don't, the, the metabolites which really associate with myeloid are um, not those metabolites. They seem to be like N-acetylated amino acids. And truthfully, I don't know why and acetylated amino acids associated with myeloid abundance. That's a reviewer question that we just dodged. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Thank you. Sabina. I, yeah, just very briefly, very beautiful work. And, and I think that the association that you see with the histamine and the, the response to sunidine makes a lot of sense because we and others have published that there is a very, very strong association between mm -hmm. mast cell infiltration and microvascular density. So that really means it, we, we almost consider mast cell and in clear cell RCC as a, an angiogenesis marker. So that's really, really cool. Thank you. That's nice to hear. I, sometimes, you know, you write something and you're not sure if you can hang your hat on it. So it's nice to, to hear that. Thank you. I think David really wants to ask a question. He's, oh, no, I was he's gonna, just... <laughs> I'll ask a question since here anyway. Um, I guess you, you're finding these really good correlations. And how do you sort of separate whether the metabolites are just reflective of, for instance, the immune microenvironment that's there versus actually having some causal role in sort of shaping either the infiltration there or at least the phenotype? Um, how do you sort of think about separating those two out? Yeah, I, I have no idea how to do that. I, I have to admit, I, I, I'm very cagey about it. It's unclear to me whether, you know, a myeloid rich region is metabolically distinct because myeloid cells have a different metabolic profile or whether it is the fact that other cells in the microenvironment have now adjusted themselves metabolically in order to compensate <clears throat> for the myeloid cells. And we'll say that we have one little piece of data which is that pan cancer, we find, for example, that some metabolites associated with NAD are really at distinctly different abundance in uh, immune rich versus immune cold environments. And there's a, a PI in, in the University of Victoria, Julian Lum, who's developed an assay to rapidly purify cell types and then do metabolomics. And in fact, he sees exactly what we see that for some reason, NAD is poised at a completely different level in CD45 positive cells, which has, I think, pretty huge implications for how we would think about redox and every NAD dependent enzyme. But outside of NAD, I don't know at all what's going on and single cell technologies are not at the place where they need to be to, to uh, address your question, but it, it's like the, the million dollar question. Um, hey, uh, so um, the, uh, the 
the beginning of your, of your talk was very interesting from a chromophobe perspective because it's very, uh, very sensitive to ferroptosis. And I wanted to um, ask also about whether you've had the opportunity to look at how um, regions of high or low cysteine correlate with uh, the presence of sarcomatoid or the more uh, classic clear cell histology. Uh, that, that's a good question. I actually don't think we evaluated that, um, but it's something that we can go back and do. I will say that that the the thing about chromophobe and, and ferroptosis, I, it is certainly true, I think based on, on uh, your data and Lisa's data that it's more sensitive to ferroptosis, but I think almost every queer cell, sub, uh, every RCC subtype is upregulating glutathione. They just really like glutathione. They, they love it, yeah. And um, just one question about the um, data that you mentioned that you have publicly available about the thousand tumor, I think, which, ha uh, which have a correlation between RNA and uh, metab metabolic profile. Is, uh, does it have uh, chromophobe RCC data? Uh, it doesn't. Um, well, I don't know. I, basically, my, my lab's MO is that we don't really make our own data. We repurpose other people's data. And I know that Lisa has generated a bunch of metabolomics data on chromophobe. I don't know if you did RNA-seq on it, but if you have, then we can just, we can do it. Yeah. That's great, thanks. Can I ask one, one more, Ed? So when you say this areas of the tumor is rich in cysteine, like what part of it? Is it, is it the actual cancer cell at the single cell level, you know, tumor cells or this the micro how this was processed? Because different area can do uh, different things. And, um, you know, based on what Kim and Jeff showed, it, it's really not, unless you have, significant, I mean, it could be an area of the tumor that has a part that is very high. So when you look at it all, it looks very high, but some areas are not high. And what's the implication clinically of it? So uh, I'll speculate a little bit. It's hard to know where cellularly the cysteine is localized, but I would, I would bet a little bit of money that the glutathione is tumor cell intrinsic. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I, I think it's, it would be unexpected if, you know, T cells just had a hundred fold accumulation of glutathione. I think that's really coming from the tumor cells. And we know, <clears throat> we know that cysteine is used to make glutathione. So I would presume that that is a tumor cell intrinsic. Um, I, I would presume it's a tumor cell intrinsic phenotype, but I, yeah, I can't say for sure. Okay. So it pains me to cut off this fantastic discussion, um, but we're going to have to switch to our next speaker. So um, if we could bring up Dr. Eddie Saad from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to present on host immune signatures as predictors of response to immunotherapy-based regimens in patients with metastatic RCC. Thank you to Ed. <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity to present our work on behalf of our team. Uh, I will be talking about host immune signatures as potential predictors of response to immunotherapy-based regimens in metastatic RCC. So as you all know, the treatment of metastatic RCC has rapidly evolved during recent years in order to include a combination of immunotherapy-based regimens and VEGF-TKIs. However, we know that the response to systemic therapy in metastatic RCC is variable. And while some patients will benefit and have deep durable responses, others will not. So therefore, the question that has been asked multiple times during the course of the last two days was, are there biomarkers that help us to predict that and maybe help us in our therapeutic decisions. So far, the majority of studied biomarkers can be described as being tumor specific, which refers to the fact that they are studied in tumor biopsies. They include genomic alterations, transcriptomics, immune cell infiltration, or histology. However, we know that the tumor itself is not the only determinant of prognosis and response. And we know that the interaction between the tumor and the host's immune system is the one that conditions clinical outcomes in patients with metastatic RCC. And this is really what drove us to look at host-specific biomarkers, and more specifically at the actors of the immune response itself. So more specifically at the T cell and the B cell components. And therefore our aim was to determine the association between T cell and B cell immune repertoires and clinical outcomes in patients with metastatic RCC 
treated with either VEGFTKI or immunotherapy-based regimens. Our cohort included 386 patients with metastatic RCC from the FCI, and these were divided into two groups, either those receiving VEGFTKI alone or those receiving immunotherapy-based regimens, and these could include either ICI alone or ICI plus VEGF. We collected blood samples from all of the patients and also tumor samples whenever these were available. And now using the blood samples, so the PBMCs, we were able to perform DNA-based TCR sequencing. And we did that both at baseline and during follow-up. And you can see the number of samples that passed QC on the slide. And then using blood samples and tumor samples, we were able to perform RNA sequencing. And using a pipeline that was developed by Lee Song and colleagues, we were able to infer the heavy chain component of the B cell receptor. And now combining all of these data together, we ask the following two questions. So for each type of regimen, how do responders differ from non-responders in terms of TCR and DCR immune repertoires? And how do these repertoires change and evolve during therapy? So naturally the first question was really to look at the infiltration of the tumor by immune cells. And in order to do that, we relied on RNA sequencing from baseline tumor samples. And as you can see on these heat maps, we used multiple immune deconvolution algorithms to estimate the different abundance of immune cell populations. And there were really no differences in terms of abundance of immune cell populations between responders and non-responders, with a caveat that there was a small sample size used in this analysis. Moving on to the adaptive immune system itself, we started to look at the T cell component. And we really studied what is known as TCR clonality. Clonality is a metric that is used to describe the T cell population in a certain individual. And basically the higher the clonality, the higher the prevalence of identical or highly similar TCR within that T cell population. So you can think of it as having a higher clonality means a more oligoclonal, TCR repertoire, a more focused TCR repertoire. And this is often seen in cases where the immune system is activated, such as an infection or even cancer. And looking at these box plots, we were able to see that responder to immunotherapy-based regimens had a trend towards an increased TCR clonality compared to non-responders. So again, they had this more oligoclonal, more focused TCR repertoire at baseline. This was not seen with VEGF-targeted therapy. And so building on, on that, we looked at the evolution of TCR clonality in patients treated with ICI-based regimens. And we really were able to detect two different patterns. So responders to ICI-based regimens started with a more oligoclonal, more focused TCR repertoire, and did not have much change during therapy. However, looking at non-responders to ICI-based regimens, they started with a more polyclonal TCR repertoire, a more diverse TCR repertoire that evolved during therapy to a more oligoclonal and more focused form. However, this was not sufficient to drive the response to immunotherapy-based regimens. Moving on now to the second part of our discussion, looking at the B cell component. And this is particularly relevant because recent studies have showed that there is an increasingly recognized role of B cells in driving the response to immunotherapy-based regimens. And especially looking at what is known as tertiary lymphoid structures that lie in the vicinity of the tumors and might be able to produce antibodies that target the tumor itself. And here we looked at blood samples, looking at the heavy chain fractions of these BCRs. And what we saw was that responders to immunotherapy-based regimens had a higher fraction of one particular isotype the IgG1 at baseline compared to non-responders. And again, this was only seen in immunotherapy-based regimens and was not observed in patients treated with VEGF-TKI alone. What's even more interesting is that we were able to corroborate the same results that were find, found in the blood in the tumor itself. So also a higher IgG1 fraction at baseline in responders to immunotherapy-based regimen compared to non-responders. And again, no differences seen in patients treated with VEGF-TKI alone. 
So in conclusion, we were able to detect differences in the T cell and B cell immune repertoires that exist and are associated with the response to ICI-based regimens in patients with metastatic RCC. These findings were host-specific and existed at baseline before the start of any therapy, and they were highly specific to immunotherapy-treated patients and not VEGFTKI monotherapy. They included increased TCR clonality at baseline in blood samples, again pointing to this more focused TCR repertoire, and an increased baseline IgG1 fractions that was found in both blood and tumor samples. These findings combined can offer a potential role for immune biomarker development, with obviously a need to validate these in much larger cohort and potentially in combination with other biomarkers. And this has been just our starting point, and we would like now to look at the antigen specificity of the TCR and IgG1 antibodies in responders, and hopefully build on that not only to have biomarkers, but potentially also therapeutic targets. I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to this work that has started many, many years ago, um, especially Dr. Tony Schwery, and of course, all the patients and their families. Thank you. Thank you. We'll invite our last speaker of the session, Dr. Anupama Reddy from the Vindhaya Data Science Incorporated, who will present a spatial proteomics enables identification of prognostic biomarkers in papillary renal cell carcinoma. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so excited to, to be here and to share our work on spatial omics. This is a really cool collaboration with uh, Dr. Scott Hake and Dr. Katie Beckerman. So, um, you know, we heard yesterday really cool talks on spatial biology and how we can use it, you know, to, to understand what's going on in terms of tumor microenvironment and so on. So I, I really like Dr. Braun's uh, fruit salad example, but here's my take with Legos. I have plenty of Legos in my house, so I have to use this. But unfortunately, I can't put my Legos in the blender, but it's the same analogy, right? We're going from bulk sequencing where we're getting sort of average signals and we're trying to correlate that with clinical phenotypes to single cell sequencing, where now we understand the cell types, we can look at proportions and, and all kinds of cool things. But uh, what we are looking at now is spatial omics. So we have single cell resolution and the XY coordinate. So we can now sort of map the cellular organization of tumors and then correlate that with, with response. So this particular study, so we're, we're studying papillary uh, RCC. And uh, you know, I'm sure all of you know more about papillary RCC than, than me, I'm a computational biologist. But our goal here was, can we look at spatial biomarkers and sort of correlate that with clinical phenotypes, explain more about the heterogeneity of these tumors? Uh, this cohort had 100 early stage patients, and we're, we're using TMAs in this case. So we have three uh, tumor samples and three normal samples for every patient, and these are represented in four slides with 612 uh, spots. Uh, we're using uh, Akoya Biosciences Codex, or you know, what they call now as the phenocycler assay, and uh, we've used uh, 30 protein markers. So in total, we have a very rich data set. We have, uh, you know, after cell segmentation, two and a half million cells identified across these TMAs. So in terms of the spatial data analysis, we start with cell segmentation. We need to be able to attribute expression of these markers sort of reasonably accurately to a given cell. Uh, so that's step one. Then we have our QC normalization of the markers and so on. And then the part that surprisingly we found challenging was the cell type assignment, right? So the standard methods, if you look at single cell and so on, is clustering. But we only have 30 markers. And these 30 markers are not sort of random. They were picked based on different immune cell types and so on. So using clustering-based methods, which capture mainly the variation in the data doesn't work. And also what doesn't work is the simplistic, let me use a threshold and then, you know, positive, negative for a given uh, uh, marker, 
because then you see that your cell now suddenly is a B cell as well as a T cell based on those thresholds, right? So we've developed this sort of novel probabilistic algorithm where we, we've represented the cell types, the, the cell type annotation hierarchically. And we traverse, so we compute the probability for a given cell to be assigned to a given cell type by traversing the tree from the root to the, to the leaves and then computing the probability. So for the probability, we take into account the intensity of the markers as well as sort of the tree structure, right? What's the probability of the parent of that given cell type as well as the siblings and then come up with the final sort of score and then assign the cell to the uh, cell type with the highest probability. So you could end up with a cell that, you know, just reaches the T cell level and doesn't go to one of the, the leaves, uh, the, the children of the, of the T cells. Uh, and then, uh, so that's the cell typing. Once we have that, then we can go back, look at the neighborhoods of the cells and uh, run spatial analysis. So in terms of spatial clustering, so this is just a cartoon to kind of you know, drive home the neighborhood analysis part of it. So the, the yellow star is, is a cell and we're looking at the neighborhood around it. And we're looking at what are the proportion of different cell types in that neighborhood. So for example, the heat map here represents the neighborhood. The cells are along the rows and the colors represent the proportion of different uh, cell types. For example, that the cluster that's shown in the red box uh, is endothelial cells that are close to pan-CK positive cells and macrophages. So this is just to give you an example of what a spatial cluster looks like. And I'm showing you two examples, you know, two TMA spots where it, when you just look at it, it looks very different, but the, the red cells, which are the endothelial cells are indeed close to both PAN-CK as well as uh, CD68. So this is an example of a spatial cluster. So just in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the white TMAs versus whole slide images, but feel free to ask me this during the question uh, session. So we, we identified over, a fifth, over 50 clusters in this data. So here's a vignette that, you know, we, uh, so we identified uh, five different spatial clusters of M2-like macrophages. So these are CD163 positive uh, macrophages. And what was very interesting is this, uh, the M2-CD4 positive spatial cluster. So these are M2-like macrophages, which are found close to CD4 positive cells. And they're very interesting because we ran associations with clinical data, and we see that this cluster is found in 16 patients, and those patients have a higher risk of recurrence of cancer, as well as worse prognosis in terms of survival. And none of the other clusters seem to have uh, that association. We also looked at the overall proportion of M2 macrophages, and you know this is the standard analysis, right? You look at a slide, you say 20%, 10%, and so on. So just those proportions, if you split them into high, medium, and low groups, then we don't see an association with survival. Sort of highlighting you know, uh, the point I'm trying to make, which is that spatial analysis is useful and sometimes can explain some of these, these clinical measures. So if we go back to the TMAs, just to sort of visualize these clusters, so the first uh, two sort of spots show the M2CD4 spatial cluster, where we see in teal the CD163 marker and CD4, and you can see in both slides, there's sort of this remarkable overlap of these cells, the, the pink and the, the teal, they, they come together. And in the other clusters, you don't see this, in the M2, M2 spatial cluster, we're just showing one example, you're seeing this massive aggregation of the teal cells, whereas the M2 with the non-M2 macrophage, of course, we didn't have other markers for macrophages in our 30, so we can't characterize that, but the dark blue parts represent the non-M2 macrophage cluster. And we see some nice structure there with uh, how they are uh, co-occurring. So in summary, I've shown you, uh, uh, you know, how we're using spatial omics to come up with you know, prognostic biomarkers. The challenge is, of course, interpretation, right? What, what do these patterns mean? What are you know, correlated versus what can we sort of attribute to the biology and, uh, and validate. 
Um, and in terms of you know, ongoing work, we're also looking at spatial transcriptomics where you can measure many more markers, right? So nanostrings cosmics has a thousand genes and now they even claim 6,000, right? So you're sort of getting to the single cell resolution but you're, you're having the sort of the, the spatial component to it. And we're also looking at uh, some cool AI methods where if you take an H&E slide, and I think this was also shown in yesterday's session, an H&E or even just a bright field image, right? Can you predict some of these virtual, can you predict some of these stains? And, you know, we're, we're using GANs and so on, but our thought is that the morphology of these cells, the way they are organized might, you know, help with that prediction. I don't think for every cell type, but, uh, you know, the, the question is where can it help? Because then you don't need to stain for those. You can just make that prediction. Okay. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you so much to our speakers. And maybe I'll start off this Q and A with a question of my own. And this is actually for um, these two and also Vincent, maybe if you could also weigh in. That, you know, as we go, as we develop different biomarkers and go through a discovery biology process, it's also critical that we find ways to bring these biomarkers to our patients. And the FDA has a very well-defined biomarker development pathway, including grant funding opportunities for NCI that Dr. McKee, I think we'll talk about later tonight where you can take a biomarker that's been developed and identify and go through a process from clinical utility studies that show in, uh, impact in terms of patient outcomes, depending on whatever context of use you decide, but that will then drive you towards analytical validation and then move into the clinical validation study that would lead to really something we can use to impact and guide patient care. So maybe if I could ask each of you to just say, you know, where do you see that you're at in terms of your bio, uh, entering that biomarker development pathway? And do you really need more validation or can we actually really kind of push your work, you know, really fascinating towards true clinical utility studies that will say, yeah, we need to get into analytical validation now. So Vincent, maybe you could start. All right. uh, thanks very much. Um, specifically for plasma or serum Kim one measurement, the biomarker has a characteristic, which is interesting, which is that it's actually already validated by the FDA. Um, the FDA previously validated it as a biomarker for kidney injury. Um, and so the existing infrastructure in terms of the optimal ways to analytically replicate experiments and to, and to, and to measure the biomarker across laboratories, uh, including research laboratories, is established. For the clinical development, I think the key is going to be not just showing signal in patient cohorts, but showing a signal that's clinically actionable and showing that this can improve patient outcomes. It's a very high bar to reach. And my suspicion is that for circulating biomarkers, including Kim one um, but also other circulating biomarkers that others have discussed in, in this and yesterday's session, including CTDNA, cell-free methylomes, um, even, um, even uh, circulating tumor cells, there may be some kind of multiplex needed to attain a significant signal that can be a clinically actionable target. And for example, um, I showed that in our cohort, if Kim one is rising, it strongly suggests the patient may not respond to therapy but there was one patient out of 54 who still had response despite a rising KIM-1. And I think we'll need to sort of a calibrate our signal to be able to be a little bit more specific. Thank you very much. Dr. Reddy. Um, thank you. Um, so I totally agree with Dr. Vincent saying that there should be some sort of combined approach where it's not only one biomarker, but also, I mean, I'd like to think of some sort of machine learning algorithm where you can feed clinical data, but also maybe all of the data that come from this conference and hopefully they will be able to predict which patient would be able to benefit or not. This is more of a theoretical wishful approach, but like looking at the biomarkers that we have right now, at least like the immune part that I have presented, I think that there is some signal out there, but I, don't think that so far it's ready to be uh, used in a clinical changing practice. And Dr. Reddy? Uh, I, I think it's very exciting that we've seen so many different biomarkers being presented just even in this conference, right? Uh, you know, the challenge might be in like what assays do we use and how can we integrate these and, and have a better understanding of them?
No, thank you. It's, it really is a very complex question. I think this audience is well suited to try to address that. And especially, uh, perhaps there's opportunities. We don't always have to predict perfect outcomes, but if we have better on-treatment biomarkers, Vincent, as you've shown, that may help us identify those higher at-risk patients earlier, that I think creates some opportunities to intervene. Thank you so much. Other questions from the audience, right here. Uh, so Dr. Saad, uh, really exciting to see uh, that you can identify the signal in peripheral blood, right? That you're able to see the changes in uh, the T cell repertoire. So my question would be, it's kind of an obvious one. Uh, what do you think those T cells are responsive <laughs> against? And have you tried, you know, kind of a secondary question, have you tried any of the alg algorithms to show if they're related or not, like a dominant motif analysis? Uh, or linking it back to the tumor. Okay, so thank you for this question. Um, and this is exactly what we're working on because obviously the first question that comes to mind is we have higher IgG1 fractions and more focused T cells, but what do they target? Right. And um, so we have tried to run some of the available algorithms in order to infer the specificity of these uh, TCRs and BCRs. We found some signal related to some viral proteins uh, but this is very preliminary, and obviously we would like to dig more into that, um, hopefully looking at more antigens that have been described, such as ERV-derived uh, antigens, uh, and this is the work that we would like to be doing. And uh, if anyone else is interested or have any ideas on how to move this forward, we would be more than interested to discuss. So there's, um, you can look at what's publicly available, you can look at some of these algorithms. Another way to kind of take a less biased approach is to just look at uh, uh, TC clonotypes that have similar specificities. You don't know what they're specific against, but like a dominant motif analysis will tell you at least they have uh, a similar specificity. In, in fact, we also looked at some data that I haven't shown in the slides where we try to see if the TCR or the T cells in the blood also have the same specificity as the T cells in the tumor there was a percentage of clonotypes that was shared. However, the percentage, of, the percentage of shared clonotypes itself did not differ between responders and non-responders. So again, we would like to be looking more into these specifically and see what exactly that they are targeting. Uh, Dr. Reddy, I have a quick question for you. Have you done any analysis on this? So we have looked at spatial transcriptomics uh, which is Dr. Beckerman's cohort. And I, I think that some of the patients there are metastatic. It's still ongoing work. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, I feel uh, in terms of, actually, I'm glad the slide is still up there. Uh, I think that's a very important question. What do these patterns mean? So I think that's probably the crux of the study. Like, how do we interpret this massive amount of data? Actually, this, this, these patterns are also visible, like you may know, even on the HNE slides. And of course, there is way more information in these. So I think this is a complex problem. Um, uh, uh, I completely agree with you. <laughs> yep. And uh, also, I feel, um, I mean, we, we have moved away from a tissue microarray-based approach in kidney cancer. Uh, uh, and we actually did a lot of TMA work in prostate cancer, and we started doing some work in kidney cancer, but the intense heterogeneity, which has been mentioned so much at the meeting, we have actually now moved away. So there is, there is actually there's not any study we do uh, utilizing tissue microarrays. I can understand for a proof of concept that can be helpful. My suggestion would be to at least do few full tissue sections uh, so that there's not really any sampling bias. Uh, and uh, I, I think, this study is also really very geared towards, since you're looking at papillary renal cell carcinoma, and we know that primary papillary renal cell carcinoma based on the TCG data, about 15% of those have met abrasions. Overall, they're MET-driven tumors. Somehow I feel that uh, we are lumping the MET-positive and MET-negative papillary RCCs in the same bin from a path perspective, as well as translational, as well as the clinical trial perspective. So I'll be very curious if you are able to actually check for genomic abrasions for MET in your cohort and see if you'll see any differences between the MET positive tumors and the MET negative tumors. We also have uh, exome seq data. So we are looking at mutations and so on. And I agree with you about TMAs. So our strategy right now is, you know, use it for discovery. And we were also sort of testing multiple different platforms. 
to figure out like what kind of you know what we can use going forward but we're validating what we find on the whole slide images thank you and uh, we have two questions so these are and then <laughs> thank you eddie great presentation really good study uh did i mean we know some hla types are uh, associated with immunity uh, and response and certain actually uh, therapies now CAR T cell therapies are being developed with a specific HLA type in mind in those patients that's you, you enrich you select this is what how you select those patients did you look at HLA in your host study uh, I'm sorry I didn't hear the last part of the question HLA HLA oh. uh, no we haven't looked at that in that part of the study um, maybe like in future works we would like to address that too and our last question for the session yeah, uh, Dr. Reddy, I have a couple questions for you. Thank you for the presentation. You do a lot of uh, spatial proteomics and spatial transcriptomics work too. Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, what was the motivation behind going with the nearest neighbor measurement versus something that was more distance measured? Because uh, you can imagine holes or something like that would introduce a lot of bias in what is considered close to your anchor cell. Um, and then have you thought about looking more at the, the more spatial statistics oriented um, measurements like Ripley's K, Moran's I, Curie's G, something like that, that's more ecologically based, but can be brought over to this? Yeah, absolutely. So for the first question, yeah, we are using both, right? So we're looking at 200 closest cells, but also at a maximum distance of 200 microns, exactly for this reason. So if you're sort of at the you know, the, the corner of the, the TMAs or like the tissue stone or something. We don't want, you know, that, that maximum distance to be very large. And I also, I feel like this parameter sort of needs to be tuned based on, you know, what we expect to see in terms of the spatial pattern. Is it, do we expect to see something very large? And then we need to sort of, you know, make that size much bigger. And we, or you want to make it very small because you don't want to miss something that's, you know, rare or so on. Yeah. And for your second question about statistics, yes, we are sort of looking at measures uh, that correlate with, you know, the tissue being more disorganized, right? And seeing if, you know, there are portions of the, the image that, that exhibit that, and if that's correlated with 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 the clinical phenotypes, etc. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Well, thank you to our speakers. Really fantastic presentations, and thank you to the audience. This has been a wonderful discussion. <laughs>